Welcome to Schoolinary, the online cooking school that transforms people and connects cultures. You will learn with the best chefs in the industry and you will discover the broadest online catalog of topics related to gastronomy. We publish new courses every week. In our podcast, we have coffee with a chef every week. Each of them will tell us about their experience and their vision for the culinary world to help you better understand this exciting industry. Come on, join us for coffee. So today we are joined by Micha Schaefer, culinary director at Noble Hart und Schmutzig in Berlin, Germany, and change agent whose manner of activism helped him earn a Michelin star and recognition as one of the world's best restaurants. His currency is quality, and as a decorated chef, he's got access to the highest quality ingredients available, but they're not what you think. Avoiding trendy buzzwords in food, he's chosen instead to define what he does on his own terms, which you can learn all about in his culinary course, Preserving Techniques in Modern Cuisine. Hi, Micha. Welcome and thanks for joining us for coffee. Hi, thank you. <laughs> so before we begin, are you a coffee drinker? Yes, I am. Addicted. And how do you take your coffee? Um, often. <laughs> <laughs> Any special preparation? No, not necessarily, no. But uh, it's actually the only thing that has me caught. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do any kind of sort of drugs, but coffee has me has me tightly. Ah, well. I do coffee. <laughs> that's fine. I mean, if that's the uh, worst of your vices, I think you're doing all right. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Let's find out. If you would, please uh, tell us in your own words who you are, where you're from, and that's uh, so that our listeners have a chance to get to know you a little bit better. I am from from Berlin or I live in Berlin. I've been in, in Berlin for um, about a decade now, a bit longer. And for yesterday, for nine years, we had our anniversary yesterday. Uh, I've been at Nobelhart und Schmutzig. Um, we've tried to change the way people think about food or people actually eat. Uh, we've tried to have an impact in the city uh, through our voice and uh, through what we do every day. I'd like to say that we did have an impact so far. Uh, of course, it doesn't go as fast as you, as you would like it to, but in Berlin, there's a movement. Yeah. yeah so uh, now that you've celebrated nine years, uh, what was kind of the, the arc of of evolution from when you first arrived in Berlin to now? When we opened up in 2015, um, Berlin was, there wasn't as much gastronomy for one. It was more of a club city. People go to party. And the other one, the other thing is um, we were the first ones to promote um, regional producers. We said we would only use regional products, uh, not exclusively, nothing else. And that means you have to skip uh, trading companies and you have to work with the farmers directly. That means you have to work with the farmers uh, and not just like order stuff, but you have to understand what they're doing. You have to visit mm -hmm. them. You have to build a relationship. You have to understand or begin to understand how gardening works, how a dairy farm works, uh, and then what a what a good fairy dairy farm does and what a very good dairy farm does. and what kind of qualities actually in a in a spectrum where a guest can also experience it that that it's mm. special and not just any regional milk or any regional carrot um, yeah how, how did you start making those contacts with those producers that are around you in berlin um berlin we have a lot of farmers markets which is kind of an old tradition and you have to really walk around and look for them and they're very skeptical especially if chefs they've had a lot of bad experiences huh. and then you have to say hey um this looks nice can i visit you and then you go there and you just talk to them and then you just buy their stuff and then a month later you buy more and and sometimes it goes wrong and expectations are not met yeah. <laughs> and sometimes it works out for nine years yeah right well you've obviously built yourself a, a reputation and, and kind of on on the strength of your cooking as well probably uh have established some very good relationships there in the berlin area well mostly the most important thing was to not have financial discussions whatever whatever a farmer asks for his produce is what we pay and it's usually a bit more than what you pay for anywhere else 
sometimes you have to tell people to ask for more money because it's worth it and they need to survive <laughs> that's the whole point <laughs> yeah. um, but that's been the main main thing to keep things going that's probably a really unexpected conversation on the part of the vendor and this in the buyer when the buyer says you should be charging more you should be charging me more not you should just be charging more is that how it went or sort of how it went yeah yeah, yeah. well it is <laughs> So you mentioned uh, you mentioned somewhere that you're from Western Germany, quote unquote, a region that's not known for good food. And then right after that, you added most of Germany is not known for good food. And I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on German food. Well, um, there's different kinds of food culture in Germany. There's south of Germany, which is maybe um, more well known, like Bavaria. And you have... Um, uh, like roasted pigs or uh, pretzels and spätzle and you have traditional dishes uh, but in, in north germany you have very few traditional dishes and you can't really eat them at restaurants you have to m be invited to someone's grandma or something like that mm. but all in all it's not as rich as a french food culture or a italian food culture where as a restaurant you can just go and cook classics and just try to make them as good as possible like uh, in italy you would go to piemont and you get it's totally normal to get a, a tomato from around the corner or a hazelnut or uh, a shrimp or whatever grows there is celebrated hmm. and celebrated at homes and also in the restaurants and this kind of food culture is non-existent in germany it's a mix of everything it's a, all kinds of cuisines of the world. If you go out eating in Berlin, for example, uh, and the, all the food that you buy at supermarkets or in trading companies is mostly imported. But don't you think that at one time, what you could get around the corner there in Berlin was what there was? And that I think maybe perhaps with globalization, we lost a little bit, bit of that. And maybe what you're doing right now is kind of bringing that back. Or is that just speculative? Um, well, I'm putting an emphasis on it. Um, yeah. The only one who can bring it back is uh, politics and where they put their money. It's what you do every day. It's what you buy every day that has the impact. And the regional food is hard to get and it's hard to pay for um, as, a, uh, as a restaurant and as a private person as well. Yeah. And um, we're trying to just show that as much as possible. Yeah. So on a little bit of a lighter topic, as I mentioned in the intro, you are the culinary director at Berlin-based Nobelhart und Schmutzig. Our listeners might like to know what the restaurant name is in English and what's behind the name. Uh, trans it would translate into something like uh, noble, hard and dirty. One version of the story is that <laughs> that's how we like the uh, for our guests um, for the evening to go. Start noble. Be a bit mm -hmm. hard and tough in the middle because you're maybe drunk and and dirty. <laughs> and, but originally it was just it was just a, um, a headline for a newspaper about in a newspaper about polo sport, and we copied it because it's very easy to remember. <laughs> yeah, you must have answered that question a thousand times by now. But it's still a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a great name. Very well. It's a conversation piece for sure. Uh, the restaurant follows a rule with respect to the food it serves. Uh, if it doesn't grow in or around Berlin, as you mentioned, you won't find it at Noble Heart. Now, once again, and I think this was for the second time in 2023, the restaurant was named one of the world's 50 best restaurants. How have you elevated the food you prepare to earn this distinction? Mostly through very simple craftsmanship. We learn the craftsmanship of butchers and of bakers and of nouvelle cuisine, the very classic French cuisine. And just, you know, we don't, we never use any food thickeners. We don't hardly ever use mostly what Ferran Adria is famous for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I learned that as a young cook. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's amazing and super interesting uh, what you can do with it. But I like to present the quality of the ingredient and for that usually you don't you don't do much to it and the 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 nouvelle cuisine and the classic craftsmanship the old school class craftsmanship of cooking is made for that that's yeah that's the way uh, Lyon was 
built. Right. And now uh, for people who might be a little less uh, less informed or less involved in the food world or actually what you do, there are a couple terms that show frequently in relationship to the restaurant. Can you explain what vocally local and conscious reduction mean, please? Um, well, vocally local means uh, what you just said, that we uh, source only from around Berlin. And that we're very vocal about that, <laughs> yeah. uh, meaning we share the producers, we share where we buy, we also share how much we spend, we share our recipes, whatever we can share, we share because it's important to um, for other people to be able to copy what we're doing. Hmm. Um, and what was the other word again? Oh, conscious reduction. Oh, well, that's what people use to uh, describe my style on the plate then at the end of the day, because um, like when I when I buy when for example, when I serve um, a piece of, let's say, a pig, because yeah. you said a pig is big in Spain, mm -hmm. uh, which is ob obviously is uh, for me, that means uh, I have one farmer where I buy the pig. Um, I've met the pig. I've organized the <laughs> slaughtering with him. I've yeah. probably fed it as well, uh, thrown potatoes at it or my mm -hmm. kids have. Um, and then I know that he butchers it at the farm. Uh, I organize with him when and how it comes to the restaurant. And then we hang it and then we take it apart from the bone. And then we serve each and every guest probably a, sing a separate, a different piece from the, from the pig. Because a pig, uh, like one neck, for example, doesn't last the whole dinner service. Yeah. Um, and since it's so much work and it's such an amazing farm and such an amazing piece of meat where the quality is... As a guest, even as someone who doesn't eat that animal every day, like I have, mm -hmm. you can understand the quality of the meat. Yeah. And since it's that way, I just I just serve that. There's one thing with it to make it an enjoyable plate. Mm -hmm. And that's called what, what people call reduction, minimalistic reduction. <laughs> oh. Just usually what the plates look like. And since you just touched upon it, or we've we've uh, mentioned it a couple of times, uh, so you not only source your ingredients from local farmers, you also work with them to plan what to cultivate for your menu, I gather, with respect to the animals or the plants, perhaps. How does that relationship work? Can you take us through that? Well, it's absolutely chaotic is what it is. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> As a young chef, I started out and tried to plan really from month to month. Turns out that doesn't work at all because nature doesn't work that way. And then you end up with 10 tons of squash or something like yeah. that. You don't know what to do with it. And what you what you expected didn't come. And then what you wanted a little bit of, you, you have way too much of it. You can feed the entire city. <laughs> so with the gardeners, what I do is that I just listen to them and... Uh, like we meet, I meet all of the farmers in December and we talk about the next year and they tell me what they're planning and what their ideas are, are. And I tell them things like just because we bought, I don't know, 80 kilos of beetroot this year doesn't mean we're going to buy it next year. So don't, don't go do too crazy on beets. And we just kind of have a conversation about expectations and that's it. But what's most important is, is that it's a, that our kitchen and the way we're staffed and the way we operate is very different from every every other kitchen in the way that we don't no one ever says i want to cook this or let's cook that or a guest says i want that let me i want to i want this mm. kind of dish but we always ask uh, the farmer what he has and that's what we're serving that's the way to go because you can only serve what they have anyway so <laughs> yeah i think there's there's one rule also that you follow uh quality is one of your highest principles and it influences nearly every action you take as a chef, if I'm not mistaken. How do you seek out good quality ingredients? And more importantly, how do you know when the quality is good? Um, so I had a decade to learn about farming. Uh, not that I could farm at all. It's a craft of its own, but that's why I visit farms and meet the people and try to understand how they work. Mm -hmm. And based on their understanding of soil, their understanding of the animals, it's actually pretty easy to determine whether or not it's going to be a good good product or not. And then during the year, sometimes it varies a bit, like you can have an amazing 
uh, tomato one day and two days later when the next harvest uh, comes into your restaurant it rained for two days and it tastes watery a bit and then you have to work differently with it then you have to you can't just serve it raw you have to dry it a bit for it to become as intense you have to understand that you get a different produce each time you the delivery comes to the restaurant yeah and you have to be <laughs> you have to react quickly yeah I, I think you mentioned in one of your culinary videos that you can actually taste if the soil where the plant was grown uh, was good or bad. How do you determine that? I had this experience with uh, one farm specifically, which had different kinds of soil in the garden uh, due to some prehistoric movements or whatever. I think it's hard to determine. I think it's it takes, but it takes experience. Like with an animal or with dairy products um it's probably easier to just taste um with vegetables it's um it takes a lot of experience but at the you know, end of the day the criteria is always if you just eat it raw or just as it is sure mm-hmm. um, and you want another one and then you want another one and then you want another one yeah that's good quality <laughs> and that doesn't happen with the uh, everyday salad or uh, everyday onion or you know the things you can get usually yeah that's true actually because uh if you feel like you've tasted eggplant for example or onion something that you think you know and then you taste it when it's been cared for and grown really nicely it's it's the the taste is just in the stratosphere and you just can you can never go back to where you where you where you once had eggplant from the grocery store or from some place where they were commercially produced it's just not the same so exactly but, but it's hard to systemize like uh, it's a feeling yeah. it's it's something it's an experience that you that you can go back to like this is good or this is different but good yeah and something you have to talk about in the kitchen as well like why is this good or why is this not good there has to be a language in the kitchen where you talk about that so right now we're speaking in february and given the heightened seasonality of your ingredients what might we find you cooking during this time or in the winter so the toughest time is still ahead Uh, Mm. the toughest time for me is march and april but also february a little bit because for people are sick of winter they want they're they're looking for spring and like the sun comes out in march but the veggies come out end of april (laughs) and there is a bit of a bit of time where we uh, work with all the products like basically from end of january to middle or end of april we work with all the products that we've uh, pickled or fermented or uh, that are in our basement uh, that we spend all summer on uh, preserving in some way or the other, which is a lot. Uh, this year, this year I've had twenty two thousand euros worth of food in the basement in end of December, just preserved food, and it's things like pickled flowers, dried roses, like pickled elderflowers, pickled elderberries, pickled tomatoes. Uh, fermented uh, mushrooms, uh, tomato juice, dried rose petals, like all very summery things, things that are amazing at their height, that are that you have tons of things that usually think also things that have a smell. That's what's, what makes our menu exciting in, in winter. Other, otherwise, it would just be meat and kale. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good year round um, products, those. Well, what is the size of your storage facility, if I might ask? It's way too small and you can hardly move. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's built very high. You can't really get to shit. So, if you, well, let's get into your course actually. So, your course is called, like I said, Preserving Techniques in Modern Cuisine. And it demonstrates some of your techniques for preserving food. How did you get into the craft of preserving? I learned some of the preserving techniques from my former head chef. We worked together with the biology department of the university in Frankfurt. Also, I studied a lot of cookbooks on pickling and and on fermenting. Like there's there's good literature now and the rest is just doing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, It's walking through nature with the eyes on the side on the side of the sidewalk trying to find things that are in season now yeah uh, looking at the bushes looking trying to smell what what is good at the moment what is potent at the moment and then understanding creating the experience and the knowledge of 
uh, how you can preserve it best, how you can preserve either the texture or the smell or just the taste and how to do it effectively, like how to do it in three hours with four people and not take a week. Right. And if you're, you're investing tens of thousands of euros into into preserving things at the height of their flavor and you have to get it right the first time there's no yeah. second chances well and it does fail sometimes so oh. um, it, it, sometimes it just goes bad and you have to throw it out it's a risk that you have that you take as well sure can you explain the shift from preserving food as a necessity to preserving food as a social responsibility so what I mean by that is at one point before we had uh, before we had freon uh, or refrigerators, we had to preserve food. Yeah. And now when you're sourcing things from such a local like kind of a, a local resource, then you're getting so much quality out of what's around you mm-hmm. that it becomes it becomes more mm, more of a responsibility to, eat more local food because you get the best quality. So, Mm -hmm. so yeah, I was wondering if you, well, I'm just paraphrasing it, but you would know better. What's what the shift from preserving food as a necessity to preserving food as a social responsibility. Is it a social responsibility? What do you think? Not yet. I think it's not yet a social responsibility, I think, but it could become one, but mostly it's as a restaurant, it's a, it's a responsibility. Because you have a lot of financial power and you can finance farms, you can finance foragers, you can find it, you, you're able to uphold um, whole identities and villages. And you're able to tell a story, you're able to have an impact. Um, as a private person that pickles, that's more of a, probably more of a hobby and maybe a responsible responsibility to your own health. But yeah. <laughs> Uh, or an experience, but it would become a social responsibility if a lot of people did it. I'd say trading companies are failing that responsibilities or supermarkets are in a way failing that responsibility. But it's also hard to do, like, there's no sense in preserving a food that's already been grown shitty. Yeah. So let's say we we get a crate of something very fine, the highest quality there is of, of, of that. I mean, what's a good recipe from your course to start with? The one with um, water, salt, and vinegar. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And you can pickle anything in it, really. Whatever okay. you find interesting and then add flavors to it. The best all-rounder that covers most uh, veggies, and that's the easiest to do. You just have to work clean and sterile and I have to make sure everything's boiled but taste wise i think it's the starter yeah i think that's that's the basis for the mushrooms with the parsley sauce which also yeah. uh is in my future to make because that looked really good so aside from the video tutorials and recipes that are in your course what would you most like people to get out of it what i got out of pickling was a fascination for it not for pickling itself but for the foods and to understand seasons, I think that's something I wanna uh, I wanna catch people with because it's it's like you're not just pre- preserving a food, you're preserving a time that the food grew in, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. That was ripe, and if you eat it in in February, you can go back to that time. That's a very beautiful way to relive your your own summer, in a way. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. So. I think that uh, one of the best things that maybe before we even arrive to take your course, for example, what we could do as home cooks or budding professionals or the like is is make those connections, find those local providers that are providing the highest quality ingredients. Is that a way that we could become agents of change in the style of Noble Heart and Schmutzig? Yeah, or... Um... I mean, you could go to the page and just learn about pickling, but the actual approach that's connected to reality is you are somewhere and you have, you're at a farmer's market or you're in your own garden or at your fridge and you have this amazing food and you're like, I, I want to pickle this and I want to mm-hmm. preserve it. How do I do it? And then you go to the course. 
that would be the ideal way to, to approach the topic. <laughs> that would be a much shorter uh, commute too from my house. <laughs> the fridge with a few <laughs> steps. So you've collaborated with many people who have vision like yourself and who take action to guide us into the future with respect to food also like yourself. Uh, do you have anyone you would recommend for a future episode of this podcast? Uh, oh, so many. I think the most interesting chef I know that has endless stories to tell and is good, to, good at telling them, much, much better than I am, is uh, Mehmet Gus from uh, Istanbul. Oh, okay. From, from Mikla. He uh, has amazing stories to tell. Turkey is fascinating, but the culinary world of Turkey is crazy. Well, Micha, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to have coffee with us, virtual or otherwise. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. If you like this episode, don't miss an episode by becoming a member. We're waiting for you each week with more guests. We're on all podcast platforms. Just search for Coffee with Schoolinary. We're also waiting for you at our website and on our social networks, where you can get to know all our courses and teachers. 